Still not, still not trimmed it. Refuse to trim it. Like, doing this takes up a lot of my time. I don't have time for grooming or looking after myself. Right then, folks, we've got a pretty major decision coming in the next few weeks. We have to decide who we want in charge of this crazy little island of ours. And it's going to be a tough decision. It's one that's already marred with a smokescreen of bullshit that is already turning this general election into something quite inaccessible. So how is a young 20-something like myself supposed to make my mind up? Well, ever the millennial, I just... I just took a quiz. Yep, my wonderful girlfriend, the illustrious music and fashion blogger at Han Says. This video is sponsored by Han Says. Turned my attention to this the other day. This is iSideWith.com, and on iSideWith.com you will find a 2017 general election quiz. Basically, you're asked a bunch of different questions on a slew of topics, and at the end of the quiz, it will tell you which party your beliefs align with the most. The quiz is mostly structured into yes or no answers, but it does also offer the option to select other more specific stances that might align better with your opinion. Each question also asks how important that particular topic is to you, ranking from least important to most important. Which I thought was quite a neat idea. Quite a neat idea. Now, whether or not all this quizzing and all those questions make for an accurate answer, I'm not too sure on. I am quite sceptical of this quiz and its validity for many reasons, but it does a good job in getting you thinking about the hot topics currently swirling around politics. It certainly got me reasoning and lining up how I feel about certain issues, which I think is vastly important as we approach the election on June the 8th. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this quiz, tell you how I answered, talk through my opinions and my beliefs, and then reveal how the quiz thinks I should vote. And we're going to be doing this video in two parts, so this is part one. The reason for that is because it asks a lot of questions and it brings up a lot of issues. And in the interest of not melting my brain or yours, I thought I'd do it in two parts to make it just a little bit more digestible. Now, I've got to state here, this is no original idea of mine. I saw Colin Moriarty do this a few weeks ago with the Political Compass quiz, but I thought it relevant, especially now, to do something similar to that. So thank you, Colin, for the inspiration. And if you haven't watched his channel, Colin's Last Stand, I implore you to go over there. There's some great stuff over there. Definitely worth a watch. So let's get to this quiz. You can do this quiz on your phone, on your computer and everything. I'll have the link in the description if you want to go and try it out. It's pretty good, I thought. There are some flaws in it. Some of the questions are a bit weird. It's split into different sections. So the first section is social issues. And the first question is, what is your stance on abortion? I, I went pro-choice on this one. And I went... Uh, more important. Abortion is a sensitive issue, especially for a male to try and answer this question. I can't imagine what it's like to be a woman in that situation where that decision has to be a possibility in your head, like ending the life of an unborn child. And I'll never be in that position as a, as a male. I'll never experience that. Ultimately, though, I think it has to be pro-choice. The decision has to be up to the woman. I find the pro-life stance to be a little bit uncomfortable because I don't think the government should have a say in what we can or cannot do with our bodies. Like there is a sort of protection that needs to be had on unborn on unborn children. There has to be some co some sort of protection there. And I do think like after a certain after a certain like length of time, like you should not be able to get an abortion. Where that falls, I don't know. I think that's up for question, but I don't think abortion should be completely ruled out. I think it has to be pro choice. Just imagine like having been raped and then having to have the child of your rapist. That argument alone is is more than enough to convince me that abortion should be an option. Okay. Moving on, so two and three are pretty similar, I thought. Do you support the legalisation of same-sex marriage and should gay couples have the same adoption rights as straight couples? I went yes on both of these and I thought that was most important. Um, they're pretty similar issues, I'd say. They're almost identical issues, so this is going to be one answer for me. I think it's just a flat yes. There's no question here. This is an equality issue and your sexuality should have no deciding factor in whether or not you deserve the same human rights as every other human on the planet. But I don't, I don't see now how in this modern day that it's still an issue. It certainly shouldn't be. Whichever hole you like to put your penis in should not be an issue, nor a concern of the government. Why does it matter? Seriously. Why does it matter? That's the first section. Social issues in the quiz. Uh, next one is... National security issues. First question in this section is, should the UK assassinate suspected terrorists in foreign countries? So what I mean about these being tricky. So, so I went into the other stances on this and I said, I said no, they should be captured and given a fair trial. And I think that's somewhat important. It's a complicated issue because meeting violence that modern terrorism promotes with more violence seems moronic and almost paradoxical. I think more of an effort should be made to police terrorism rather than just setting on fire the country from which the terrorists come from, like we did with Syria after the Paris attacks. I think it's important that we have to show these people and these terrorists that we will not be reduced to their level, and that they will answer to crimes they commit in the West and in our society, 
in the way that every other human does. Every other person will would be trialled and sent to prison for for the same crimes. But you put it under that guise of terrorism and it kind of takes away the uh, morals and the principles of our society. I get that they are that terrorism is less human. It's against what we believe in. But I don't think we should let that change how we react. It shouldn't change our principles. Going straight to murder and assassination in this way, it's exactly it's exactly the reaction they want. They want this kind of excessive reaction to fuel their their agenda. I think apprehension, fair trial, and like interrogation could also bring about a, a solution far faster than just carpet bombing places. Okay, moving on. Similar question again. Should laptops be banned from all direct flights departing from the Middle East? I went no on this one, flat no, and I think this is more important. Uh, again, this kind of comes to our way of life and how much we want terrorism to to take control of our way of life. You know, if it gets to the point where we suspect everyone and suspect everything coming from that part of the world, then like we might as well have said they've won. The whole part of terrorism is to induce terror, and if you are terrified of a certain part of the world, then and that's it. That we can't show that terrorism is working on us. It gives them, again, like I said previously, it gives them more fuel. And painting all people of that culture and of that part of the world with the same brush, it's, it's again, it's that, it's that fear thing that they prey on. It's making us afraid of of other good, decent human beings with plain intentions. And I think banning electronics on flights, just like a flat, like cover all ban, is ridiculous. It's fear for the sake of fear. I think it's giving too much to terrorism. I think we have to make a stand, and I think that is one of the most important ways we can make a stand. Okay, next. Fucking section. Next section. This is heavy, isn't it? Question number one in the environmental issues section. Should the government increase environmental regulations on businesses to reduce carbon emissions? I went other stances on this one. I said yes, and provide more incentives for alternative energy production. So yeah, global warming is a thing that isn't going away. I think it'd be foolish to let any attempt to combat global global warming uh, slip from under us. I think that's a fight that we need to keep up and we need to keep pushing on. And if offering an incentive to businesses to find some sort of alternative energy solution is like the way forward, then I'd be I'd be 100% behind that process. You know, I, I'd happily support something that you know keeps planet Earth around because I think that's a good idea. I don't want to burn up. And ginger, I get it's hard enough out there for me. Don't don't make it worse. So I think yes, keep up that keep up that uh, pressure on businesses to reduce their carbon emissions it, it makes it makes perfect sense to me there's no reason why we shouldn't want to protect the very one thing that's keeping us alive next question on this section is should disposable products such as plastic cups plates and cutlery that contain less than 50 percent of biodegradable material be banned i went no increase consumer incentives to recycle these products instead and i went somewhat important on that um, now i find restrictions like that or ideas like that a little bit too extreme poisonous toxic materials yes ban those that that's that makes that makes sense in my head, but with plastic cups and cutlery, there's no like imminent threat with those. They just they just stick around for a bit. They don't degrade too quickly. So, and I, I get like the, dump, the dumping of waste in sea is an issue, but at the same time, mate, it's like you're not going to poison the earth with like a plastic cup. I don't think restrictions like that should be like even considered. It's a little bit too too much for me from the government, really, if that was to be the case. Nevertheless push that incentive to recycle. The government's already doing a pretty stellar job at encouraging people to recycle. I know my family and other people that are close to me do make the effort to recycle now. It's almost second nature, like to separate into the bins that they've provided, like what recycling material is and what it isn't. I think everybody kind of understands what can be recycled now. And everyone does, does do it. Even after I've had a few tins of beer and I'm pissed drunk, I still like make the effort to recycle, even in that inebriated state. I'm still separating the cans. I'm not just throwing them straight in the bin. So I think keep up that push to recycle and make people understand that those plastic cups and those items that aren't so biodegradable need to be reworked into the system. Next question. Do you support hydraulic fracking to extract oil and natural gases? I answered no. We should pursue more sustainable energy resources instead. And I answered that as somewhat important. I didn't exactly know what hydraulic fracking was. I didn't, I'd heard of it before, but I didn't, didn't really know the ins and outs of it so i looked into it and fucking christ is that thing extreme like what they need to do in order to extract gas and oil in fracking is absolutely bonkers and it's also it also seems quite a very costly way to procure some very archaic energy sources i know that most of the world is ran on that but it's about time we stop burning like dinosaurs right the long-term effects of fracking aren't all that 
well known either. There is some evidence that it encourages toxins in groundwater, which is problematic, obviously. But we, there's no really long-term study to see how much environmental damage it actually does. And I can't help but think like the resources for hydraulic fracking and the expenses of it could be poured into something a bit more sensible, like finding a sustainable, clean energy source, like nuclear fusion, or research into harnessing like solar power a little bit more efficiently. Like after reading about it, I don't really agree with just like raping the crust of the earth for a little bit of a little bit of oil. Again, it comes to the carbon emission thing. It's like why why destroy the one thing we rely upon? Let's not do that. Let's use science and brain power. That'd be a good fucking idea. Okay, next section. Economic issues. Should the government raise the national minimum wage? So the national minimum wage is different to what we have in the UK called the national living wage. So if you're aged between 21 and 24, you get a minimum wage of £7.05 per hour. If you're aged 25 and over, you get something called the national living wage, which is £7.50. So that, that, that's the, the bare fact. So I answered uh, yes according to inflation on this question. I think it's less important though. So I think, accor I think according to inflation, because it makes the most sense in my head, like things get more expensive so we should be able to afford them on like the minimum pay basis. There is some argument though that these rates are too low currently and I'm inclined to agree a little bit but I'm not I'm not fighting the, the fight for it. There's this is foundation called the Living Wage Foundation and they did some research and found out that the real cost of living is actually £8.45 an hour opposed to the £7.50 an hour. I'm not going to doubt how they came to find that figure. Like It seems, it seems legit. I'd like that pay. But I kind of have to take this question from a more personal angle and my own personal situation. I earn over the national living wage as it is. Um, it's not by much. And for my current situation and the costs of my current situation, I get by. I get by well. Ish. I figure out a way to make what money I earn work for me and provide the life I kind of want. If that situation were to change, though, I know that I could get more money. Do you know what I mean? I could work harder and work faster and just work to earn the money I need to fund whatever situation. I don't believe that money is an issue. I don't think money is hard to come by nowadays. You can work for it. You'll find money. I think it becomes problematic when you have the... Forgive me here, but you have lazy people who push the blame away from themselves and onto the government for not paying them enough money or for not encouraging employers to pay enough money. And I think that's not, that's not the government's concern. Whether or not you're lazy, like if you're able-bodied, of course, if you're able-bodied and you're able to work and you're able to work hard, then I don't see how you can push the blame onto the government for how little funds you have. That's just my personal take. Just work hard. Don't be a lazy fuck. You can't blame someone else for you not having enough money. And I feel like the Living Wage Foundation is like proliferating that. That's maybe not its intention, but saying that the, the national living wage should be higher than it already is does kind of give people that... Um, that excuse to say, oh, it's your fault. It's the government's fault. It's not my fault. I work hard. When really, you could work harder. Everyone can work harder. But anyway, went off on a tangent, didn't it? Yeah, I, I agree that um, the national minimum wage should be risen, but risen in accordance with infl inflation. Should the government prosecute people who avoid paying taxes by hiding money in foreign bank accounts? I went yes on this one, and I think it's somewhat important. Look, look, right, you, you, it doesn't matter how much money you earn. You earn money in the UK you're expected to pay taxes. That is the law of the land. Everybody has to pay their taxes, no matter how much money you earn. Yeah, I understand for the rich and the people who do earn a lot of money, taxes are fucking rapist. And it, and it is annoying. And I fundamentally disagree with income tax. You, you'll find out in the next question about that. But you're not above the law because you're richer or because your bank account is higher than somebody else's. I'm sorry, but your higher status does not protect you. You have to abide by the laws of the land. And if you don't, you get prosecuted. Plain and simple. Hey, next question. Should the UK raise taxes on the rich? I went no on this one, and I think this is more important. Flat no. You've worked hard to make that money. You've, gr you've done the grind. You've got built up your bank account to a sustainable level. It's a nice level. You've earned all that money, and then the government fucks you over. Bends you over the table, rams it right in you and takes that money away from you. That hard-earned money. I personally think income tax is stealing. I don't think the government should have access to your to your money like that. Especially, like, the money you've earned. Like, fuck that right off. I think all levels of income tax is horrendous. And worse still is that after, after we've worked hard and earned that money, then if we want to buy a luxury item, we get value-added tax. We get taxed again. So the money we earn gets taxed twice if we want to buy nice things. If we've worked hard to buy nice things. Like this microphone. I earned money that got taxed. And then that money that I spent on this microphone got taxed again. I'd be happy with an abolished income tax and a, a higher VAT. Because then at least I'm in control of the money I earn and how that money gets taxed. It's disgusting. Like e Even on my level, I don't earn a lot of money. But I've been taxed before to the point where I've essentially done a days free work because the money I earned that day 
just paid for my income tax. I did that hard work for nothing, and that annoys me. So I, no, I don't think income tax should be a thing at all. So I certainly disagree with raising it on the rich, people that have worked hard for that money. Ranting today, man. Ranting. Okay, uh, the next section is domestic policy issues. So the first question on this section is, should the government be able to monitor phone calls and emails? Fuck no. Not at all. I think this is most important. You, you've got to be kidding me. Like, the government should not be able to breach our civil liberties like that. We have a right to privacy. And I know, like, the, the angle on this is in the name of security. This debate came about recently after the attacks on Westminster because the attacker used WhatsApp just moments before he, he began attacking. They, they want to remove end-to-end -end encryption on things, and Amber Rudd is, like, spearheading that. And I think she's a fucking idiot because you remove end-to-end -end encryption on things. It's a blanket policy because then you have to remove end-to-end -end encryption on everything. And end-to-end -end encryption is used on your banking. So your personal bank account becomes at risk because the government wants to see what your what dirty emails you send into each other. It's it's just an uncomfortable step towards what this Orwellian kind of control. And I don't I don't want the government having a window into my private life. I don't want them to see those dick pics. Should the British monarchy be abolished? I put no on this, but I, th I think it's least important. I don't think this is really an issue that that should be um of major contention in this election. I get like the hot headline is that the uh, the million the hundreds of millions of pounds that get funneled into the royal family by the UK taxpayer is a lot. But if you look into the situation, the money that the royal family puts back into the UK economy is yeah, it's pretty high. It actually eclipses what the taxpayer has to pay. So in uh, in 2015 there was an article on Business Insider that quoted a study by Brand Finance who found that the cost of the royal family in 2015, so it's two years ago, so it's, it's a little outdated, but two years ago, in 2015, the cost of the royal family to the British taxpayer was £257 million, but their contribution to the UK economy was just over £1.1 billion. To me, that completely just nullifies the argument. No, I'm no businessman or economic expert, but I am a gambler, and if I got that kind of return on a horse, I'd be pretty fucking happy. So yeah, keep them around, you know? They do us good returns, so let's not... Let's not fuck them off just yet. Are you in favour of decriminalising drugs? I answered yes, most of them, but not all of them. And that was most important to me. Again, it comes down to a freedom thing. I think there is a lot of constriction around certain drugs, around all drugs really, uh, when there needn't be. It's something that the comedian Bill Hicks once said. He said, you never hear a good news story about drugs. It's always bad news. And his point was that every half-decent song you've ever listened to was written and fuelled by drugs. It's a tough one because alcohol and tobacco, which is... 100% legal and taxed and you know the government makes money from will harm you a lot more than things like marijuana or or certain natural hallucinogens like psilocybin mushrooms or DMT. DMT in fact which is dimethyltreptoline is a chemical that is produced by the body and some kundalini meditation techniques can actually access that kind of DMT hallucinogenic state because the chemical is in your body it's, it's in the brain it's produced by the stomach and liver as well I think don't quote me on that science Look into it yourselves. You know, the chemical compound DMT that you can ingest, which will, which just adds to the chemical that's already in your body, is illegal. It's ridiculous. I think with proper regulation, education, and more of a staggered introduction, so start with the lowest, kind of the lowest form of drugs like marijuana, and move your way up the uh, up the scale, I think you could pretty much obliterate the drug problem in the UK. You know, we could, I'd, I'd quite like a perfectly functioning society of stoners. I know people personally, and I know people that I look up to online, like the likes of Joe Rogan, they're like functioning <laughs> like drug users. Like, they use drugs in a positive way. Like I know people personally that use drugs, and they are... They're fine. They're no different to me. Alright, we're getting there. We're getting there. This is a long one. I apologise. Next section on the quiz is healthcare. Should there be more or less privatisation of the NHS? Now, this is complicated. I didn't fully understand what privatisation of the NHS looked like. I don't use the NHS. Somehow, I'm, a hel I'm, a, I'm healthy. The amount of shit I put into my body, and I'm healthy. So, the NHS is Britain's free healthcare service. The fear with privatising the NHS is that that freedom goes away, that it no longer becomes free and it's no longer a service, it's a paid for service, similar to how it is in America. The benefit of privatisation is that it allows for a higher quality of treatment and more potential avenues for treatment. I don't think the NHS is going to go anywhere. I don't think like the principles that it was founded upon, free healthcare for everyone, I don't think that's going to go away. That's pretty ingrained and baked into our society now and into our government, so I don't think we've got anything to lose on that one. I think there's too much worry around that. And I think, in some senses, privatisation is a good thing because it can offer treatment that the NHS can't offer, but through the NHS. So, for example, there was a, an article on the BBC. It was in 2015. Health correspondent Nick Triggle. Mate, you've got a great name. Mr Triggle. Amazing. 
But yeah, in this article, Trigger wrote about privatisation on the NHS. Uh, and it, he said that uh, London's Cromwell Hospital, which is run by private health firm Booper, takes over a third of NHS brain tumour patients because it has a gamma knife radio surgery centre. And the NHS doesn't have, doesn't have many of those facilities. The NHS sends patients to uh, this hospital in London to receive this, this specified surgery at the cost of the NHS. So should this kind of surgery be required to keep someone healthy, the NHS will send them to a private hospital and cover all the costs. So what I thought is I don't see why a happy balance of the two can't exist. I don't see why you can't have private healthcare and the NHS kind of working together and, you know, for the people that pay for it, for the people that can afford the luxury, let them have the private healthcare. For the people that can't afford it, the NHS can utilise the private sector if it needs to. And that's that's what the current system is, sort of. See, this is a tough one. On this question, I couldn't answer the current system. It only gave me more or less. So I went more, and I thought it was somewhat important, because I think it, it didn't give me the option to keep it as the balance that it is. Funnily enough, though, the next question, should there be more or less privatisation of the healthcare services? To me, that's that's the same, that's the same question. But this one offered up the, the the satisfied with the current system answer. So that's when I went for that one. And this is this is like what I was talking about earlier with the problem with the quiz. Like I think the questions it asked are, are pointless. Should there be more or less privatization privatization of the NHS? Should there be more or less privatization of the healthcare services? It's the same question. As far as I'm concerned, it's the same question. But yeah, that was what I answered for those ones. It's a, that is a tough one. Right. Okay. Moving on quickly. Should foreign visitors have to pay for emergency medical treatment? Uh, no. I uh, put some more important foreign visitors to any country should be subject to the healthcare system of the country they're visiting. That's fair. So get run over, you get free healthcare. That's that's the system we've set up. That's how it works. And if you're visiting, it makes sense to me. I do disagree with people coming over here to get treatment on the NHS because they can't uh, afford it in their own country. But emergency care, you know, help them out. Don't worry about it. That's the last question for this part. I'm going to leave it there for now. Heavy, right? So that's half the questions. That's half the issues this quiz brings up. I think this quiz is interesting because I think the answer it gives you at the end, like what party you should vote for, isn't the most valuable thing here. I think the most valuable thing is the the issues that the questions bring up. It's the dissemination and the examination of the questions that holds the most value. Going through and really mulling over my beliefs like this has helped me no end to figure out how I feel and where I stand. And I've even surprised myself because I flip-flopped on issues that I thought I was pretty set on. But having looked into them more, you know, I figured out something new that I that I believed in. Like re- really getting into the weeds with some of these issues has genuinely flipped my opinion on them. And I think that that's important. Anyway, check out the quiz for yourself. Go to isidewith.com. Find the quiz on there. Do the quiz. And keep an eye out for part two of this video, the, the second half of this quiz, which might come next week. Might not. I don't know. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. That was a lot of talking. Set myself quite a task there. Quite a task. Dickhead.